At this point, we're ready to dig into molecular biology, so put on your seatbelt. Our next speaker is Dr. David Ting, who's an assistant professor of medicine at the Mass General Cancer Center. And David's been particularly interested in non-coding RNAs. These are the RNAs and the genes whose function is not so clear that many of them are of viral origin and many of them are deregulated in cancer, giving you both diagnostic and therapeutic opportunities. David. Thank you very much, uh, and it's a true uh, privilege to be here this morning. I'm very excited to tell you about the work that the Ting Lab has been doing on satellite repeat non-coding RNAs. It looks like my title's not there. Um, so when I was taught in genetics, I, was, I, I remember hearing that the coding parts of the genome are the only things that mattered. Well, in fact, the, the rest of it was thought to be junk. So it turns out that that junk is not really junk after all. It's actually probably pretty interesting. That's the focus of my laboratory has been interested in understanding those repeats um, in the, the non-coding genome. And so obviously the question is, what is in the non-coding genome? It turns out that the vast majority of the non-coding genome are these repetitive elements. Those elements comprise the majority of our genome and play into the variation that we see in between uh, individuals at the genomic level. So I got interested in repetitive RNAs when we had done some sequencing of uh, the RNA of cancers and normal tissues, and we found specific, unique expression of certain repeats in cancers, not in normal tissues. And so our journey began when we did single molecule RNA sequencing of uh, human and mouse tumors. Um, and what we found was that, in fact, that we found a large amount of repetitive expression coming from non-coding satellite repeats. These are the repeats that live in the centromeres of all of our chromosomes. And what we found was there are certain satellite repeats that were being expressed more prevalently, prevalently in cancers compared to normal tissues. Those are the ones shown in black. While there are other ones that were expressed in normal tissues but not in cancers, and those are the ones shown in white. And so that was a very interesting thing. This is a defining thing in the genome that has not been otherwise looked at that was uniquely high in cancer, but not in normal tissues. And so in particular, there was one outlier, this one at the top, HSAT2. This, this particular repeat was 131-fold higher in cancer compared to normal tissues. Uh, that's a striking amount. And interestingly, we found this in all the major epithelial cancers, pancreas, colon, prostate, breast, kidney, ovarian, and lung cancer. Um, and in normal tissues of the human, we found pretty much absent expression of this particular repeat across many normal tissues. And so that has significant implications as a novel cancer biomarker. But interestingly, if we had a way to harness that difference and therapeutically target that, we would have a novel way of targeting cancer. And so that's what we've been trying to answer over the last couple of years. Uh, in terms of the biomarker, we actually uh, teamed up with Affymetrix. We licensed our technology to Affymetrix and were able to develop an RNA in situ hybridization, otherwise known as RNA-ish. This particular assay is able to visualize HSAT2, this particular repeat in tissue, as shown here in red. And we are doing this in formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue, so FFPV. This is the standard sort of histology blocks that we have in all of our pathology departments. And this platform is able to detect these repeats routinely now on an automated, clear, ready platform. So now we have a biomarker that we can visualize in archived tissue that we can use for diagnostic purposes and potentially as a pair diagnostic for any therapeutics we develop. So the, we started then looking at what, what does HSAT2 do? And so we started to look at the other repeats in the genome to understand what HSAT2 does. And HSAT2 lives in the middle of the chromosome, or the pericentromeric regions of all of our or of all of our major chromosomes. And what we find at, at the ends, another repeat known as telomeres, are found in pretty much uh, found to be universally needed to be expanded in all cancers. Uh, these repetitive elements um, are are also found in the rest of the genome called the line one element. This is the most uh, sort of prevalent repetitive element and makes up 20% of our entire genome. These elements share one thing in common. They both use reverse transcriptases to expand in the genome. So telomeres use telomerase to expand the telomeres. So you pretty much a universal necessity in all cancers. 
and the line one protein actually expands the line one repeat and moves it around in the genome in cancers. And multiple groups in TCGA have now shown that this particular repeat has been expanding in multiple types of cancers. So the obvious question was, does HSAT2 have a reverse transcriptase? And the short answer is yes. So in a recent publication, uh, Francesco Bersani, one of the postdocs, and uh, Daniel Haver's lab and myself worked on this, and we identified that, in fact, HSAT2 is reverse, trans re reverse transcribing. So it's taking its own RNA and it's converting into DNA. And it turns out that that DNA is expanding in the genome. So in TCGA whole genome sequencing data, this is in colon cancer, over 50% of all colon cancers have significant amplifications of HSAT2 at the genomic level. So this indicates that not only does reverse transcription of these repeats occur commonly in cancer, but they seem to uh, occur uh, in over half of these colon cancers. And when we looked at prognosis, in fact, these, these repeats seem to confer a worse prognosis. So now that we've established that these HSAT2 repeats are expanding, uh, they're reverse transcribing, what happens if we can block reverse transcription? Does that actually affect the cancer cells? Can this uh, kill cancer cells in a way? And in this process, we had actually found a very interesting thing. We, we found that if you take any cancer cell line from any cancer and grow it in standard 2D, sort of standard adherent culture, so growing in plastic, with FBS, with normal uh, media, you have absolute zero expression of HSAT2, zero, all cell lines. Uh, well, if you take that same cell line, stick it in a mouse, make a tumor, you have massive amounts of HSAT2. If you now take that same cell line and were to grow it into a 3D tumor sphere, which sort of mimics more like an in vivo tumor, you see expression again. So what this really tells us is that this pretty prevalent feature in vivo is not seen in anything we do in standard culture, uh, which is a really telling thing. Uh, so interestingly, when we try to block the reverse transcriptase, so we use a nucleoside competitive uh, analog to the C, uh, to, uh, or we use a locked nucleic acid that's sequence specific for the HSAT2, if we then treat these cell lines in standard culture, it doesn't have an effect, no effect. Now, if you take these same cell lines and make these 3D tumor spheres and treat these with either the locked nucleic acids or the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, you now see a significant reduction in tumor sphere capability. And so what this tells us is that if this, these classes of drugs are tested in a routine sort of cell line screen, we would have missed these compounds. And in fact, DDC was developed by the NCI, and in initial testing in the NCI-60, no effect. So we took this into the mouse and made a tumor, treated these mice with these nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and in fact, we see in vivo that these drugs do have an effect on tumors in vivo. Now, this really sets up that these repeats are important for cancer cells and that blocking them uh, can lead to cancer cell death. But I think that uh, one of my collaborators has actually shown a potentially more interesting thing. Uh, so my collaborators at, uh, at Mount Sinai have shown that the HSAT2 RNA, the same HSAT2 I found, they had found actually can stimulate certain immune cells and, in fact, is an immunomodulatory uh, molecule itself. So this suggests that disrupting these HSAT2 repeats in cancer may not only have effects on the cancer cells, but may affect the immune microenvironment. And in that setting, could it be possible that if we are able to take uh, HSAT2 and modulate its levels in some way, can we change how tumors respond to immunotherapy? Can we take cancers that are rarely not responsive to immunotherapy, which are the majority of our epithelial cancers, and can we convert them to responsive to checkpoint inhibitors by modulating this HSAT2 repeat. So I'm very excited for this data, uh, and I think there's much more to come, and I look forward to all of your questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much.